A kind of peace had endured for a century, and people had forgotten about anything else. They would scarcely have known how to react had they discovered that a kind of war had finally come. And certainly, Elias Lynn, chief of the Bureau of Robotics, wasn't sure how he ought to react when he finally found out. The Bureau of Robotics was headquartered in Cheyenne, in line with the century-old trend toward decentralization and Lynn stared dubiously as the young secretary officer from Washington who had brought the news. Elias Lynn was a large man, almost charmingly homely with a pale blue eye that bulged a bit. Men weren't usually comfortable under the state of those eyes, but the security officer remained calm, and Lynn decided that his first reaction ought to be incredulity. Hell, it was incredulity. He just didn't believe it. He eased himself back in his chair and said, How certain is this information? And the security officer who had introduced him as Ralph G. Breckenridge, and had presented credentials to match, had the softness of youth about him, full lips, plump cheeks that flushed easily in guileless eyes. His clothing was out of line with Cheyenne, but it suited a universally air-conditioned Washington where security, despite everything, was still centered. Breckenridge flushed and said, There's no doubt about it. You people know all about them, I suppose, said Lynn and was unable to keep a trace of sarcasm out of his tone. He was not particularly aware of his use of slightly stressed pronouns and his preference to the enemy, the equivalent of capitalization in print. It was a culturator, the Reds, or the Soviets, or the Russians anymore. That would have been too confusing. Some of them weren't of the East, weren't Reds, Soviets, and especially not Russians. It was much simpler to say we and they, much more precise. Travelers had frequently reported that they did the same in reverse. Over there, they were we in the appropriate language, and we were they. Scarcely anyone gave thought to such things anymore. It was all quite comfortable and casual. There was no hatred, even. At the beginning, it was called a Cold War. Now it was only a game, almost a good-natured game, with unspoken rules and a kind of decency about it. Lynn said abruptly, Why should they want to disturb the situation? And he rose and stood staring at a wall map of the world, split into two regions with faint edgings of color, and a regular portion on the left of the map was edged in a mild green. A smaller, but just as irregular portion on the right of the map was bordered in a washed-out pink. We, and they. The map hadn't changed much in a century. The loss of Formosa and the gain of East Germany some 80 years before had been the last territorial switch of importance. There had been another change, though, that was significant enough that was in the colors. Two generations before, their territory had been brooding, bloody red, ours a pure and undefiled white. Now there was a neutrality about the colors. Lynn had seen their maps and it was the same on their side. They wouldn't do it. Well, they are doing it, said Breckenridge. And you had better accustom yourself to the fact. Of course, sir, I realize that it isn't a pleasant thing to think about. They might be that far ahead in robotics. His eyes remained as guileless as ever, but the hidden knife edges of the words plunged deep and Lynn quivered at the impact. Of course, that would account for why the chief of robotics learned of this so late, and through a security officer of that. He had lost caste in the eyes of the government. If robotics had really failed in the struggle, Lynn could expect no political mercy. Lynn said wearily, Even if what you say is true, they're not far ahead of us. We could build humanoid robots. Well, have we, sir? Yeah. As a matter of fact, we built a few models for experimental purposes. They were doing so ten years ago. 
They made 10 years of progress since then. Now Lin was disturbed. He wondered if his incredulity concerning the whole business were really the result of wounded pride and fear for his job and reputation. He was embarrassed by the possibility that this might be so, and yet he was forced into defense. He said, Look, young man, the sale made between us and them is never perfect in every detail. They've always been ahead in one facet or another, and we in some other facet or another. They're ahead of us right now in robotics. It's because they placed a greater proportion of their effort into robotics than we have. And that means that some other branch of Endeavor has received a greater share of our effort than theirs. It would mean we're ahead in force field research, hyperatomics maybe. Lin felt distressed at his own statement. The stalemate wasn't perfect, it was true enough. But that was one of the great dangers threatening the world. The world depended on the stalemate being as perfect as possible. If the small unevenness that always existed overbalanced too far in one direction or the other, almost at the beginning of what had been the Cold War, both sides had developed thermonuclear weapons and war became unthinkable. Competition switched from military to the economics and psychological, and it stayed there ever since. But always there was the driving effort on each side to break the stalemate, to develop a parry for every possible thrust, to develop a thrust that could be parried in time, something that would make war possible again. And that was not because either side wanted war so desperately, but because both were afraid that the other side would make the crucial discovery first. 400 years each side had kept the struggle even. And in the process, peace had been maintained for hundreds of years. As the byproduct of the continuously intensive research, force fields had been produced in solar energy and insect control and robots, each side was making a beginning in the understanding of metallics, which was the name given to the biochemistry and biophysics of thought. Each side had its outpost on the moon and on Mars. Mankind was advancing in giant strides under forced draft. It was even necessary for both sides to be as decent and humane as possible among themselves, lest through cruelty and tyranny, it couldn't be that the stalemate would now be broken and there would be no war. Lin said, I want to trust one of my men. I want his opinion. I want to consult him. Well, is he trustworthy? Yeah. What well, men in robotics has not been investigated and cleared to death by your people. Yes, I vouch for him. If you can't trust a man like Humphrey, Carl Laszlo, then we're in no position to face the kind of attack you say they are launching, no matter what else we do. I've heard of Laszlo, said Breckenridge. Good. And does he pass? Yes. And I'll have him in. And we'll find out what he thinks about the possibility that robots have invaded the USA. Not exactly, Breckenridge said. You still don't accept the full truth. Find out what he thinks about the fact that robots have already invaded the USA. Laszlo was the grandson of a Hungarian who had broken through what had been then called the Iron Curtain and he had a comfortable, above-suspicious feeling about himself because of it. He was a thick-set and balding with a pugnacious look graven forever on his snub face. But his accent was clear Harvard. He was as excessively soft-spoken. And to Lynn, who was conscious that after years of administration he was no longer expert in the various phases of modern robotics, Laszlo was a comforting receptacle for complete knowledge. Lynn felt better because of the man's mere presence. 
What do you think? A scowl twisted Laszlo's face ferociously. I think that they're far ahead of us. Completely incredible. It would mean they produced humanoids that could not be told from humans at close quarters. It would mean a considerable advance in robomentalics. You're personally involved, said Breckenridge coldly. Leaving professional pride out of account. Exactly why is it impossible that they be ahead of us? Laszlo shrugged. I assure you that I'm well acquainted with their literature on robotics. I know approximately where they are. You know approximately where they want you to think they are, is what you really mean. Have you visited? Have you ever been to the other side? I haven't, said Laszlo. Nor you, Dr. Lin? Lin said, well, no, I haven't either. And Breckenridge said, Has any robotics man visited the other side in 25 years? And he asked the question with a kind of confidence that indicated he knew the answer. For a matter of seconds, the atmosphere was heavy with thought. Discomfort crossed Laszlo's broad face. And he said, well, As a matter of fact, I haven't held any conferences on robotics in a long time. 25 years. Wonder why? Isn't that significant? Maybe. Something else bothers me, though. None of them have ever come to our conference on robotics. None that I can remember. Were they invited? Asked Breckenridge. Lynn, staring and worried, interposed quickly. Of course. Breckenridge said. Do they refuse attendance to any other types of scientific conferences we hold? I don't know. I haven't heard of any cases of you, Chief. No, said Lynn. Then Breckenridge cut back in. Wouldn't you say it was as though they didn't want to be put in the position of having to return any such invitation? Or as though they were afraid one of their men might talk too much? That was exactly how it seemed. And Lynn felt a helpless conviction that security's story was true after all. He felt it wash over him. Why else had there been so no contact between sides on robotics? There had been a cross-fertilizing trickle of researchers moving in both directions on a strictly one-for-one -one basis for years, dating back to the days of Eisenhower and Khrushchev. There were a great many good motives for that, an honest appreciation for the supernatural character of science. Impulses of friendliness that are hard to wipe out completely in the individual human being. The desire to be exposed to a fresh and interesting outlook, and to have your own slightly stale notions greeted by others is fresh and interesting. The governments themselves were anxious. There were always the obvious thought that by learning all you could and telling as little as you could, your own side would gain by the exchange. Not in the case of robotics, not there. Such a little thing to carry conviction, and a thing, moreover, they had known all along. Lynn thought darkly, we've taken the complacent way out. And because the other side had done nothing publicly on robotics, it had been tempting to sit back smugly and be comfortable in the assurance of superiority. Why hadn't it seemed possible, even likely, that they were hiding superior cards? A trump hand for the proper time. Laszlo said shakenly, what do we do? It was obvious that the same line of thought had carried the same conviction to him. Do, parroted Lin. It was hard to think right now of anything but the complete horror that came with conviction. There were ten humanoid robots somewhere in the United States, each one carrying a fragment of a TC bomb. The TCL, a 
race for sheer horror and bombery had ended there. The TCL, total conversion. The sun was no longer a synonym one could use. Total conversion made the sun a penny candle. Ten humanoids, each completely harmless in separation, could by the simple act of coming together exceed critical mass. Lin rose to his feet. He felt heavy. Dark pouches under his eyes, which ordinarily lent his face an ugly look, and now it had a savage foreboding. It's going to be up to us to figure out ways and means of telling a humanoid from a human, and then finding the humanoids. <laughs> How quickly! Muttered Laszlo. Not later than five minutes before they get together, and I don't know when that will be. Breckenridge nodded. Well, I'm glad you're with us now, sir. I'm to bring you back to Washington for conference, you know. Lin raised his eyebrow. All right. He wondered if he had delayed longer in being convinced, he might not have been replaced forthwith. If some other chief of the Bureau of Robotics might not be conferring in Washington, and he suddenly wished earnestly that exactly that had come to pass. The first presidential assistant was there, Secretary of Science, Secretary of Security Lin himself and Breckenridge. Five of them sitting about a table in the dungeons of an underground forest near Washington. President Assistant Jeffries was an impressive man, handsome in a white hair and in a just a trifle jowly fashion. He was solid, thoughtful, and unobtrusive. He spoke incisively. There are three questions that face us. As I see it, first, when are the humanoids going to get together? Second, where are they going to get together? Third, how do we stop them before they get together? Secretary of Silence Ambury nodded convulsively at that. He had been dean of Northwestern Engineering before his appointment. He was thin, sharp-looking, noticeably edgy. His forefinger traced the slow circles of the table. As far as when they'll get together, I suppose it's definite that it won't be for some time. Why do you say that? Asked Lin. They've been in the U.S. at least a month already, so security says. Lin turned automatically to look at Breckenridge, and the secretary Malacaster intercepted the glance. Mollicaster said, "The information's reliable. Don't let Breckenridge's apparent youth fool you, Doctor Lin. That's part of his value to us. Actually, he's 34. He's been with the department for 10 years. He's been in Moscow for nearly a year, and without him, none of this terrible danger would be known to us. And it is. We have most of the details." Not the crucial ones," said Lin. Malacaster of security smiled frostily. His heavy chin and close-set eyes were well known to the public, but almost nothing else about him was. We're all finitely human, Doctor Lin. Agent Breckenridge has done a great deal. President and Assistant Jeffries cut in. Let us say we're certain. Time. If action at the instant were necessary, it would have happened before this. It seems likely that they are waiting for a specific time. If we knew the place, perhaps the time would become self-evident. If they are going to TC a target, they will want to cripple us as much as possible. So, it would seem that a major city would have to be it. In any case, a major metropolis is the only target worthy of a TC bomb. I think there are four possibilities: Washington, 
New York as a financial center, and Detroit, and Pittsburgh were the industrial centers. Malacaster of Security said, I vote for New York. Administration and industry have both been decentralized to the point where the destruction of any particular city won't prevent instant retaliation. And why New York? said Amberley of Science. Finance has been decentralized as well. Well, it's a question of morale. It may be they intend to destroy our will to recess to induce surrender by the sheer horror of the first blow. The greatest destruction of human life would be in New York, in the metropolitan area. Yeah, but it's pretty cold-blooded, muttered Lynn. Yeah, I know. But they're capable of it. They are. If they thought it would mean the final victory is a stroke, wouldn't we do the same? President Assistant Jeffries brushed his hair back. Let's assume the worst. Let's assume that New York will be destroyed sometime during the winter. Preferably immediately after a serious blizzard where communications are at their worst. And the disruption of utilities and food supplies and fringe areas will be most serious in their effect. Now. How do we stop them? <laughs> Finding ten men and two hundred and twenty million is an awfully small needle, sir. You have it wrong. Ten humanoids among two hundred twenty million humans. <laughs> no difference. We don't know that a humanoid can be differentiated from a human at sight. They probably can't. You looked at Lynn. They all did. Lynn said heavily, We in Cheyenne couldn't make one that would pass as human in the daylight. But they... They can. But they can, said Malacaster security. And not only physically. We're sure of that. They have advanced metallic procedures to the point where they can reel off microelectronic patterns of the brain and focus it on the positronic pathways of the robot. Lynn stared. Are you implying that they can create the replica of a human being complete with personality, even memory? That is exactly what I'm saying. Could they make a robot of a specific human being? That's right. And this is all based on Agent Breckenridge's findings? Yes. The evidence, I'm afraid, it can't be disputed. Lynn bent his head and thought for a moment. And then he said, Then ten men in the United States are not men but humanoids but the originals would have had to been available to them likely they would have to be East Europeans to blend in how would they be introduced into this country then with the radar network over the entire world border as tight as a drum how could they introduce in any individual human humanoid without our knowing it Malacaster of security said it can be done there are certain legitimate sea pages across the border businessmen pilots even tourists they're watched of course on both sides still ten of them might have been kidnapped and used as models for humanoids the humanoids would then be sent back into their place since we wouldn't expect such a substitution, it would pass us by. If they were Americans to begin with, there'd be no difficulty in their getting into this country. It's as simple as that. And even their friends, 
family. Could they tell the difference? Well, we assume so. Believe me, we've been waiting for any report that might imply sudden attacks of amnesia or troublesome charges in personality. We've checked on thousands. Namberly of science stared at his fingertips. I think ordinary measures won't work, gentlemen. The attack must come from the Bureau of Robotics, and I depend on that chief of the Bureau. And his eyes turned sharply, expectantly on Lynn. Lynn felt bitterness rise. It seemed to him that this was what the conference came to and was intended for. Nothing that had been said had not been said before, he was sure of that. There was no solution to the problem, no pregnant suggestion. It was a device for the records, a device on the part of men who gravely feared defeat, and who wished the responsibility for it placed clearly and unequivocally on someone else. And yet, there was justice in it. It was in robotics that we had fallen short. And Lynn was not Lynn merely. He was Lynn of robotics. And the responsibility had to be his. I will do what I can. He spent a wakeful night. There was a haggardness about both body and soul when he saw it and attained another interview with President and Assistant Jeffries the next morning. Breckenridge was there, and though Lynn would have preferred a private conference, he could see the justice in the situation. It was obvious that Breckenridge had attained enormous influence with the government as a result of his successful intelligent work. Well, why not? Lynn said, Sir, I am considering the possibility that we're hopping uselessly to enemy piping. In what way? I'm sure that however impatient the public may grow at times, and however legislators sometimes find it expedient to talk, the government at least recognizes the world's statement to be, in some way, beneficial. And I think they recognize that also. Ten humanoids with one TC bomb is a trivial way of breaking a stalemate, sir. The destruction of 15 million human beings. Scarcely a trivial thing. It is, from the world power standpoint, it would not so much demoralize us as to make us surrender or cripple us or convince us we couldn't win. There would just be the same old planetary death war that both sides have avoided so long and so successfully. And that they would have accomplished is to force us to fight minus one city. Minus one city, that's not enough, sir. What do you suggest? That they do not have ten humanoids in our country? That there is not a TC bomb waiting to get together? I'll agree those things are here. But perhaps for some reason greater than just midwinter bomb madness, sir. Such as. It may be that the Physical destruction resulting from the humanoids getting together is not the worst thing that can happen to us. What about the moral and intellectual destruction that comes of their being here at all? With all due respect, age and Breckenridge, what if they intended for us to find out the humanoids? What if the humanoids are never supposed to get together, but merely to remain separate in order to give us something to worry about. <laughs> Why? Well, let me ask you this. What measures have already been taken against the humanoids? 
I suppose the security is going through the files of all the citizens who've ever been across the border. Close enough to it to make a kidnapping possible. I know Malacaster mentioned it yesterday. That they are falling up suspicious psychiatric cases. And what else? Small x-ray devices are being installed in key places in the large cities. In the mass areas and such where ten humanoids might slip in among a hundred thousand spectators of a football game or an air polo match. Oh yes, exactly. In concert halls and churches. We must start somewhere. We can't do it all at once. Particularly when panic must be avoided. Isn't that so? It wouldn't do to have the public realize that in any unpredictable moment, some unpredictable city and its human contents would suddenly cease to exist. I suppose that's possible. What are you driving at? That a growing faction of our national effort will be diverted entirely into the nasty problem of what Amberley called finding a small needle in a very large haystack. We'll be chasing our tails madly, while they increase their research. They'll get their lead to the point where we find we can no longer catch up to them. And we must surrender, without the chance even of snapping our fingers in retaliation. Consider further that this news will leak out as more and more people become involved in our, in our countermeasures and more and more people begin to guess what we're doing. Then what? The panic might do us more harm than any of the TC bombs. And the presidential assistant said irritably, In heaven's name, man. What do you suggest we do then? Nothing. Sir, I say we call their bluff. Live as we have lived, and gamble that they won't dare break the stalemate for the sake of one bomb head start. It's impossible. It's completely impossible. The welfare of all of us is very largely in my hands. And doing nothing the one thing that I can't do. No, I agree with you. Maybe, perhaps, that x-ray machines, sport arenas are a kind of skin-deep measure that won't be effective. But it has to be done so that people in the aftermath do not come to the bitter conclusion that we tossed our country tossed our country away for the sake of a subtle line of reasoning that encouraged do-nothingism. In fact, our counter-gambit will be active indeed. What do you mean, sir? And then, Presidential Assistant Jeffries looked at Breckenridge, the young security officer hitherto calmly silent. It's no use talking about a possible future break in the stalemate. The stalemate's broken right now. It doesn't matter whether humanoids explode or don't. Maybe they are only bait. Only here to divert us, like you say. But the fact remains that we are in a quarter of a century behind in robotics. And that... That's a fatal mistake. What other advances in robotics will there be to surprise us if war starts again? The only answer is to divert our entire force immediately and now into a crash program of robotics research. And the first problem is to find the humanoids. Call it an exercise in robotics, if you will. Call it the prevention of the death of 15 million men women, children. 
Lin shook his head. He felt helpless. You can't. You'd be playing into their hands. They want us lured into the one blind alley while they're free to advance in all the other directions. That's your guess. Your guess. Breckenridge has made his suggestion through channels, and the government has approved. And we will begin with an all science conference. All science. Then Breckenridge said, We have listed every important scientist on every branch of natural science. They'll all be at Cheyenne. There will be only one point on the agenda how to advance robotics. The major specific subheading under that will be how to develop receiving a device for the electromagnetic fields of the cerebral cortex that will be sufficiently delicate to distinguish between a protoplasmic human brain in a positronic humanoid brain. And Jeffrey said, We had hoped you'd be willing to be in charge of the conference. I wasn't consulted on any of this. Obviously, time was short, sir. Do you agree to be in charge? Lynn smiled briefly. It was a matter of responsibility again. And the responsibility must be clearly that Lynn of Robotics. He had the feeling it would be Breckenridge who would really be in charge. But what could he do? Alright. I agree. Breckenridge and Lynn returned together to Cheyenne. For that evening, Laszlo listened with a sullen mistrust to Lynn's description of coming events. Laszlo said, While you were gone, Chief, I've started putting five experimental models of humanoid structure through the testing procedures. Our men are on twelve-hour days, three shifts overlapping at once. If we've got to arrange a conference, it's going to be crowded, red taped out of everything. Work will come to a halt. And Breckenridge said, Well, that will only be temporary. You'll gain more than you lose. A bunch of astrophysicists and geochemists. They want help towards robotics. Views from specialists of other fields may be helpful. Are you sure? How do we even know there is any way of detecting brainwaves so that even if we can, there isn't a way of differentiating human and humanoid wave pattern? Who set up the project anyway? I did. You did? Are you a robotics man? The security agent said calmly, I've studied robotics. That's not the same thing. I've had access to text materials dealing with Russian robotics in Russia. Top secret material well in advance of anything you have here. Lynn said ruefully, Well, he has us there, Laszlo. It was on the basis of that material that I suggested this particular line of investigation. It is reasonably certain that in copying off the electromagnetic pattern of a specific human mind into a specific positronic brain, a perfectly exact duplicate cannot be made. For one thing, the most complicated positronic brain, small enough to fit into a human-sized skull, is a hundred times less complex than the human brain. It can't pick up all the overtones. Therefore, there must be some way to take advantage of that fact. Laszlo, for one, looked impressed. Despite himself, Lynn finally grinned. It was easy to resent Breckenridge, 
The coming intrusion of several hundred scientists of non-robotic specialties. But the problem itself was an intriguing one. There was that consolation, at least. It came to him quietly. Lin found he had nothing to do but sit in his office alone with an executive position that had grown merely titular. Perhaps that helped, gave him time to think, picture the creative scientists of half the world converging on Cheyenne. It was Breckenridge who, with cool efficiency, was handling the details of preparation. There have been many kinds of confidence in the way he said. Let's get together and we'll lick them. Let's get together. It came to Lynn so quietly that anyone watching Lynn at that moment might have seen his eyes blink, slowly, twice, but surely nothing more. And he did what he had to do with a whirling detachment that kept him calm. When he felt like that, by all rights, he ought to be going mad. And he sought out Breckenridge and the others' improvised quarters. Breckenridge was alone. Is there anything wrong, sir? Well, everything's right, I think. I've invoked martial law. What? A chief of a division. That's what I am. I can do so if I'm in the opinion that the situation warrants it. And over my divisions, I can then be dictator. Chalk up one for the beauties of decentralization, huh? You will rescind that order immediately. When Washington hears of this, you'll be ruined. I'm ruined anyway. Do you think I don't realize that I've been set up? the role of the greatest villain in the U.S. history? The man who let them break the stalemate? I have nothing to lose. Perhaps a great deal to gain. What a target the Division of Robotics will be, a eh? Breckenridge. Only a few thousand men to be killed by a TC bomb capable of wiping out 300 square miles in one microsecond. But 500 of those men would be our greatest scientists. We would be in the peculiar position of having to fight a war with our brains shot right out. I think we'd just surrender. What do you think? This is impossible. Lynn, do you hear me? Do you understand? How could the humanoids pass our security provisions? How could they get together? Oh, but they are getting together. And we're helping them do so. We're ordering them to do so. Our scientists visit the other side, Breckenridge. They visit them regularly. You made a point of how strange it was that no one in robotics did. Well, ten of those scientists are still there and in their place. Tim humanoids are converging on Cheyenne. That's ridiculous. In the best case, that's just a guess. Yeah, but I think it's a good one, Breckenridge. But it wouldn't work, would it? It wouldn't work unless we knew humanoids were in America so that we could call the conference in the first place. Quite a coincidence that you brought the news of the humanoids, isn't it? Wait. And you suggested the conference. Wait. And you suggested the agenda. And you're running the show. And you know exactly what scientists were invited. Did you make sure it was the right ten? Dr. Lin. He poised to rush forward. Then Lin said, Don't move. 
I've got a blaster right here. We'll just wait for the scientists to get here one by one. One by one we'll x-ray them. And one by one we'll monitor them for radioactivity. No two will get together without being checked. And if all 500 are clear, I'll give my blaster and surrender to you. How about that? Only I think we'll find the 10 humanoids. Sit down, Breckenridge. Professor Jimenez of the Institute of Higher Studies, Buenos Aires, exploded while the stratospheric jet on which he traveled was three miles above the Amazon Valley. It was a simple chemical explosion, but it wasn't enough to destroy the plane. Dr. Herman Leibowitz, MIT, exploded in a monorail, killing 20 people and injuring 100 others. In similar manner, Dr. August Marine, Montreal, and seven others died in various stages of their journey to Fayan. And lastly, Laszlo, Jeffries sat together. I thought you were nuts, Chief. But well, you were right. They were humanoids. They had to be. Only they were warned. He warned them. And now there won't be one left intact, not one to study. <sighs> I didn't understand. I thought he was a traitor. Nothing more than that. Sure, he warned them. But how could he do so while sitting in that chair? Unless he were equipped with a built-in radio transmission. Don't you see it? Breckenridge had been in Moscow, and the real Breckenridge is still there. Why didn't he explode? I guess he's just hanging on, I suppose. Yes, I suppose at least we will have one to study. He bent and put his fingers in the sticky fluid of trickling out of the mangled remains at the neck. Not blood, but a high-grade machine oil. 